Exactly. Well, welcome, everybody. So happy to have you with me on this early November fall day, how fast this year is going. And today we're going to talk about direct examination. If you have not had the opportunity to join us for the first two parts of this series, the first one being jury selection and last month's opening statements, uh, not to worry. You can catch up at your convenience uh, in multiple ways. You can listen to it on my podcast at The Mentor ESQ. You can go to the website, thementoresq.com. You could go to the Trial Academy's website where they have all of uh, the programming on demand. Uh, if you are not an Academy member, you're enjoying the free CLEs, which is fantastic, but I would encourage you to be an Academy member. Uh, if you feel that you're getting value out of the CLEs that you've been attending, uh, once you become a member, there's so many more things you can avail yourself of. You can get involved in making change. You can be on committees and screening committees and join boards. And it's just a great organization that I'm proud to be a board member of and a past president leader of. It's statewide. And, um, and it's normally $250. Because you're attending a CLE, you get $50 off, 200 bucks, and you get all the benefits. So I really encourage you to consider joining. Um, before we get underway to talk about today's program, I have one more short housekeeping thing. Uh, some of you may know that I ask a question of every lawyer I ever interview at the end, and I ask them how they define what it means to be a great lawyer. And I'd like to ask all of you that. Uh, if you'd be willing, I have uh, the definition was posted by Michelle just now in the chat. You can click on that link now, later, tomorrow at your convenience and give me a thoughtful answer because um, I've been meeting one-on-one -on -one with lots and lots of lawyers and just getting to know everybody uh, has been really wonderful and um, hearing a lot about what's going on in our community. And uh, I'm really interested in how we all answer this question because we all have our subjective points of view. So that being said, let's get into today's program on direct examination. Let me give you a little overview of what we're gonna try and do in the next hour. Uh, what I do is I take Q and A's um, from two to 2.30 after the hour of the presentation, because I usually need every last minute of this hour to try and get through as much as possible. Um, this is gonna be sort of a primer on direct exam. I'm gonna go over basically how to do a direct exam of a lay witness or a plaintiff in a personal injury case, or your client who may be a defendant in a case. Um, there are other methods that we employ when you conduct a direct examination of experts in specific areas. Uh, there's more high level stuff that I will do at later CLEs, but for today, we're going to go over the basics. Uh, we're going to talk about um, preparing yourself, preparing your witness. We're going to talk about how to get items into evidence, how to mark items once they're uh, in evidence. And um, hopefully, if you have never done a direct exam, this will give you the ability to go to court and do it. Uh, if you've conducted a lot of direct exams previously, have been on trial, uh, then uh, you may know this stuff already, uh, but maybe you'll pick up a couple of tidbits. It's always a worth a refresher course. So let me tell you about the materials. I saw there was a question about written materials. I'm sure Michelle can post the link. Uh, I prepared materials that um, I always try and prepare practical materials that I think will be helpful. So I've created a template that you can use for the flow of a direct exam in the materials. Uh, it's a basic outline uh, that you can use if you've never had to sit down and prepare a direct exam before. I've also included uh, CPLR 4518, which is the business record exception or permission for admissibility of business records and how to get those in. It's really important that you familiarize yourself with that uh, for putting items into evidence uh, in direct examination. So take a look at that. I've also done a primer on how to introduce items into evidence. Uh, I've listed out the questions there and uh, we'll go over that uh, together. And I've also given you the full transcript of my client, Dustin Dibble, who many of you have heard me talk about, who was in a tragic subway accident case. Uh, and it's long, but it's there. It goes through liability, background damages. So if you are interested in reading some parts or all of that, I thought that would be helpful uh, to have that also. So let's get to it. When I think of direct examination, when you think of the word direct, maybe initially you think it's, it's your case. You're, you put on your direct case as opposed to cross-examining uh, adverse witnesses. When I think of direct, I think of it as if I'm the director. I'm directing a play. Because a good direct is kind of like directing 
an actor or a performer on a play. You're on the stage. You have the judge, the jury, and you want to make everything present seamlessly and smoothly in a direct exam. And it's not easy to do. Just like acting, talking about directing plays, I find it interesting that if I'm watching a, a play or a TV show or a movie, if that acting's really good, you normally don't comment on it. You know, if you're savvy, you might say, wow, this person's an amazing actor. Um, but otherwise, you watch it, you enjoy the show, but you don't think about the acting part. But what if you watch a show or program where it's really bad acting, right? You notice it. It's really horrible. There's nothing worse than seeing someone who can't act or a bad actor in a program. It's just noticeable. It's the same thing in a direct exam. If you do it right, if you conduct an effective, efficient direct examination, no one's really going to necessarily say, wow, that was an incredible direct examination. But if you do a poor direct examination, if you're not organized, if you're not prepared, if you're floundering around with the questions you're asking, if it's disjointed, if you can't get items into evidence smoothly, there's lots of problems, it's bad. And it looks bad to the jury, it looks bad to the judge, and it looks bad to your adversary. So you don't want to have that happen. That's why it's important that you prepare yourself and you prepare your witness for the direct examination so it does seem smooth and easy. It's not easy. It is not easy to conduct a good direct examination. Now, most people get excited about cross-examination. That's sort of the superstar part of the trial. Lawyers love to say, boy, I cross-examined that witness. I took him down. Did you see me cross-examine them? But nobody, except for maybe me, uh, leaves trial at the end of the day or to break and says, oh, I'm so happy with that direct examination uh, because it's not sexy and exciting. You're not having aha moments. But I love a good direct exam because it's a way you can really bring out the important parts of your case and present them in the way that's going to have an impact on the jury uh, to help you to win your case. So. What you want to do is you want to think about, I like to use this analogy of apples that you are picking throughout a trial. And this starts in direct examination. It goes through cross-examination. And ultimately, you're picking apples or you're planting apples, but you're gathering them. And what an apple is at a trial, it's the elements. It's the pieces of evidence. It's the important parts that you need to get out to either make a prima facie case as a plaintiff making the elements of the case, or if you're defending a case, the elements of your defense, those are the apples. And you need to make sure that in your direct exam that you have a plan. You make sure to get those apples out in evidence, because if you don't get them, they're not going into the jury and it could be a problem. You want to get those apples in cross-examination. And then we'll talk about that next month in cross-examination. And what I like to say is when you're preparing for your summation, which we'll talk about in the last part of this series, you gather all those apples. You look back at all your trial notes. You say, yes, I got this on direct of this witness. Yes, I got this from that direct of that expert witness. I got this apple on cross. And I like to say, you have all the apples, you organize them, you bake them up, and you serve the apple pie on your summation. You pull it all together and you present it in a way that a jury's going to eat it up and, uh, and they're going to like it and they're going to help you win your case because you've presented it that way. So think about what apples you need when you're conducting a direct examination, when you're preparing it. And we'll talk about it in preparing cross-examination. You have to have a plan. You don't just get up there and ask questions. If you are asking a question, you always need to wonder, why am I asking this? And you need to have a good answer for that. You're asking a question either because you need to give background or maybe you're asking it so the jury learns a little bit about the client, or maybe you're asking it because you have to give an argument on causation and you need to get it out of this witness, or you're asking it so you can establish the damages, but have a reason for asking questions, okay? You have to have a plan. And then my mantra, I'll be impressed if anyone knows my mantra, please type it in now, but I'm gonna say it again. I say it, I think, in every program, it's two things. Preparation, 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 and inform your client, right? Same thing here. For direct examination, you're going to prepare the hell out of yourself, and you're going to prepare the hell out of your witness, which is usually your client. And you're going to inform your client, or you're going to inform your witness on the process. 
you have to work together like a director and an actor. You have to let them know what you're going to ask, how you're going to ask it, how you want them to present their answers. It has to be a coordinated effort to come out smoothly and effectively. All right. So first, let's talk about preparation of yourself as the attorney. What I generally like to do is when I'm preparing for a trial, I'll look at the pattern jury instructions. I'll look at the judge's charges uh, for the beginning of the case, the end of the case, and the facts applicable to my type of case, whether it's a construction accident or a trip and fall or medical malpractice or auto accident. Uh, is it an aggravation of a pre-existing injury? What are the interesting things going on that I need to prepare for? And I know what elements I need to establish. And I sit down and I write them out. And then I look at my witness list and I'm preparing which witnesses I want to call at which time. And usually the plaintiff in an injury case is usually the first witness. Not always. There's strategic reasons perhaps not to. But usually it is. And you realize, what do you want to get out of the plaintiff? What do you want to get out of the plaintiff? Well, you certainly want to humanize the plaintiff. You want to find a way to relate the plaintiff to the jury. Uh, I'm a big believer. My father's always taught me and I've agreed. And I think most lawyers will agree that if a jury likes your client, you've got a good shot. If you have an unlikable client, that's a problem. Sometimes clients are likable um, and you know them, but they don't really come across or they're, they're nervous or, or the way that they present themselves to a jury may not show their likability. So you might have to work on that. You might have to teach them how to smile and nod. These are all things you have to work on. So you think about that as you're developing your plan and you make an outline. My outline I gave you a sample of in the materials, but generally it should follow where you start with the background of who your client is. You want to bring out elements that are going to have an impact on the case. You'll see in the transcript I gave you for Dustin Dibble, he lost a leg in that uh, accident and he was an athlete. He was a young guy in his 20s. He was a college athlete. So in my direct of him, I wanted to bring out his background, his background in sports, what teams he uh, was on and what sports he played in college and high school, what positions and, and any accolades, because I knew down the line that was going to be an impact uh, later on in his testimony, obviously, about not being able to do a lot of those things because of his injury. Uh, in the Amador case that uh, you've heard me talk about uh, with the motorcycle car accident in Queens that I tried right before the pandemic shut everything down, um, he was an avid motorcyclist. And I wanted to make sure the jury wouldn't hold that against him, but talk about his love of riding and how he idolized this beautiful Harley Davidson and only took it out for special events and drove very carefully. So whatever it is, you want to bring that out. You want to get into the happening of the accident. Uh, if it's an injury case or the primary events in whatever case you're trying. Um, and then you're going to transition into the issues that are important, whether it's the liability issues, transition into damages, and medical treatment, if it's an injury case. Um, and then you're going to usually finish off with the impact questions. How's it impacted your client? Okay. Um, have they lost income? You're going to get into economics, perhaps, pain and suffering questions, loss of enjoyment of life questions future concern questions. I'm not going to be able to chase my grandchildren around or throw a football with them like I was hoping to. These are all things you want to think about and what you want to bring out. So you write them down either in an outline form or you could actually type up or write out questions. This is the one time you have a chance that you could actually read questions and we're going to talk about how you can do that. Generally, I don't like to use notes in an opening in a summation and a cross-examination because I need to be directly engaged with the jury or the witness. But in direct examination, you will have the opportunity to look at your notes and look at your questions. So you can make sure to put down, especially you want to write out if there's really important parts for the record to make your case. For example, um, doctor, do you have an opinion within a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether the accident was a substantial factor in causing the injury sustained by my client or something like that. If you know it's an expert question, if there's certain things you need to have to make your case and to have a good record, you might want to write those out so you have those, okay? You also want to know about the types of questions you ask in direct examination. Many of you already know, but maybe some of you don't, that there are open questions and there are leading questions. 
An example of an open question is, what happened next? An example of a leading question is, um, did you take your dog for a walk that night? Okay. A leading question simply suggests the answer. So did you take your dog for a walk that night? It may be considered opening a little bit as opposed to, and you walked your dog that night, didn't you? That's a real leading question. That's a cross-exam question because you're suggesting the answer and you're really only giving the witness the opportunity for a yes or no. That type of question, a leading question is not appropriate on direct examination. You're not allowed to lead a witness because then you'd say, yeah, and uh, Mr. Amador, you're riding your motorcycle that day, right? Yes. And this person came out and hit you out of nowhere, right? Yes. And you're really badly injured, right? Yes. You could, you could do it all day long, and that's why it's not allowed. It has to come from the witness. So in direct examination, you have to be careful that you are only asking these open questions. Um, what happened next? Tell us about this. You're really opening up the door for the witness to give more of a narrative answer as opposed to a yes or no. Sometimes you want to ask a witness a question and you want to bring it out. Uh, and it's not that easy without leading them. So that's what you need to prepare with them in practice. For example, uh, let's say in my Amador case, I really wanted to make sure that my client was saying that he only brought his motorcycle out for charity events to ride it there. But I can't say, uh, and do you only bring your motorcycle out for charity events, Mr. Amador? Because that's a leading question. But then if I say, well, when do you bring your motorcycle out? What if he forgets the charity events part? And he says, oh, I bring it out when it's a nice day. I'm like, well, are there special reasons you bring it out? And he says, oh, because I love to drive it. And I'm like, come on, come on, say the thing about the charity events. So there's a couple ways you plan for that. You prepare them. When I ask this question, this is what I want you to answer. And you ask it and keep asking it and have them practice the answer. Or sometimes if all else fails and you ask it 10 different ways, you lead them and you let them know, I'll lead you. <laughs> I'll get objected to. And then I'll ask an open question. So in that situation, I might say, don't you always also bring it out, Mr. Amador, for charity events? Objection, leading, sustained. Anything else that you bring your motorcycle out for, Mr. Amador? Then the witness knows to say, yes, charity events. So you have to be kind of careful with opening and leading, but generally open questions on direct or what's permissible. Your adversary can object if it's a leading question. And if the judge starts sustaining those, that can interrupt your flow. And if you don't know how to ask the right question in an open format, um, then it's going to break up your direct and it's not going to look good if you get keep getting questions objected to and sustained. So make sure you know how to ask an open question. Um, sometimes you're going to say, what did you say to that person? Maybe they'll object that that's leading because you're suggesting they said something to that person. So a lot of times you want to preface things like, what if anything did you say? Who, if anyone, did you see there? When, if at all, did you go out that day? OK, so the if anything, you know, if at all, those are all sort of um, phrases you could add into your question that can turn what might be considered a leading question into an opening open type question. So you want to think about that. Now, I've given you a sample of an outline. So I suggest if you haven't done a direct, you can use that. It's in the materials. I'm not going to go through that with you. But now I want to talk about after you're preparing yourself and knowing what types of questions you wanna ask, having an outline or having the, uh, the questions written out, um, you can either do it in a trial notebook. Uh, a lot of people have asked me about trial notebook. It's basically like a binder and you could uh, make dividers, have a section for opening, have a section for direct. You could have all your questions in the binder. You bring your binder out when you're doing your examinations and you have everything there. So you can use a binder. Uh, some people like yellow pads. I'm a big fan of yellow pads. So uh, I'll use yellow pads a lot. I'll have a separate yellow pad for different events. Um, there's different ways to do it in levels that are comfortable for you. Okay. Uh, but you want to prepare that. Then you want to prepare the witness. And this is really important. The preparation of the witness cannot be understated. The importance of taking time to have your client or witness uh, be prepared in advance. It is not uncommon, it is more common that I will prepare a client for trial on multiple occasions. I will look at the schedule of when the trial is expected to start, and I will schedule the client to come in at least two times. Uh, and I'll space it out by maybe a few days or a week so they have time to digest things. 
Okay. You need to go through this with your client. And I'm going to talk about what I like to do. And I recommend that you do uh, because it'll help you be prepared and it'll help the client feel comfortable and be better at a direct examination. So you want to do it in, va- in advance and you want to do it several times that you're preparing your client. Now, right off the bat, I'll have my client join me and I usually like to do it in a conference room or a large office setting because then I can kind of recreate a scenario where there's some distance between me and my client, uh, sort of like there will be distance between um, yourself and the witness at the time of trial. And I sit down first and I draw out a rough sketch of what a courtroom looks like and I show it to the client. And what I'll do is I'll show where the judge sits The jury box is either going to be on this side or on this side, so I'll draw it out. I'll draw where the council tables usually are, just a rough sketch. And I'll tell them, I'll say, now you're going to be sitting up here. And what's going to happen is the judge is going to say, Mr. Smiley, call your first witness. I'm going to stand up and say, I call the plaintiff, um, Mr. Amador, to the stand. And I tell my client, when I do that, you're going to be sitting back here. You're going to get up. You're going to come up, you're going to walk over here to this witness stand, and here's what's going to happen. They're going to ask you to have a seat or stand and swear you in. Explain all these things, because that's going to take away a lot of the the fear. It's really nerve-wracking. Think about how you're nervous going into a courtroom, even if you've done it many times or not many times. Imagine your, your client, who's not a professional. They're nervous. So the more you can tell them what's going to happen, the better. Then what I do is I tell them where I'm going to be. And what's going to happen. And I always position myself at the end of the jury box. Okay. I'll take my trial notebook or my, or my yellow pad. And when the witness comes up, I get up from the council table and I walk over and I literally either with a podium or on the corner of the jury box all the way at the end, um, I will stand there. And that is where I ask my questions for. And I highly recommend that that is where you ask your questions from on direct. And there's a reason for standing there. One reason is, is it forces your witness to look towards you, which means they're looking towards the jury box. And what I often prepare my clients to do, probably always prepare them to do, is to look at the jury when giving their answer. Just because I tell them, just because I'm asking you the question, I'm asking it for the benefit of the jury. So even though I'm asking you and I know it's kind of weird, you can listen to me ask it, and then I want you to turn to the jury and give your answer, okay? And I tell them that I stand there and I'll say things like, please tell the jury, and I'll gesture with my hand towards the jury. So it's a way by being in that position, I can remind them and help them communicate with the jury because you want your witness to make eye contact with the jurors. You don't want the jurors just to see this profile of this conversation going on uh, of questions and answers back and forth between the lawyer and the witness. You want your client to connect with the jury. And a lot of people, I being one of them, feel that eye contact is really important for believing somebody. You want to look them in the eye and tell them the truth. And a lot of jurors are going to say that witness wouldn't even look, look us in the eye. So it's important. The other reason I like to stand at the back end of the jury box is for sound control. Um, Some courtrooms have microphones, some don't. Some have ones that don't work well. And you want to make sure the jurors are hearing your witness. There's a reason you've spent all this time in preparing and you're at trial. You don't want answers to go unheard. So if I'm standing back there and I don't hear the witness give an answer, then I'm pretty sure that the juror, at least the jurors closest, jurors closer to me, maybe juror six, seven, or eight, all the way at the end, are not hearing it. And I'll interrupt my client or witness and say, can you please speak up? I'm having a hard time hearing you. I want to make sure the jury hears you. Okay? So those are the primary two reasons for standing back there. So when you're preparing your client in your office or your conference room, what you should do, what I like to do, is then have them sit down at the end of the table you know, farther away from me as sort of uh, imitating them being in a jury box. Uh, I'm sorry, in a witness box, witness stand. And I stand back. And then I go through my questions and answers with them. And I explain to them that I'm going to say, you know, Mr. Amador, please tell the jury. Please let the jury know. Uh, Please explain. Please describe. And when I do that, I'm going to move my hands. And that's a sign to turn to the jury. And then maybe I'll bring someone from my office in 
uh, a staff member or if my client or witness shows up with someone, I'll ask them to sit off to the side where the jury would kind of be. And I will have the witness practice. I will ask a question and they'll practice turning and giving the answer. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury? Hi, my name is Oscar Amador. All right. It seems simple and basic and maybe even a little silly, but it's really important. Tell them to smile, tell them to speak clearly, tell them to keep their voice up and practice it. Practice asking them questions. And then once they stop looking at the jury, remind them, oh, can you please tell the jury, you know, please let the jury know so that by the time the trial comes, they're going to be prepared for that. All right. Talk to them about what to wear. I usually tell, um, clients and uh, witnesses that I don't want them to dress if it's a man in like a suit and tie um, or if it's a, a female in like a very severe sort of business dress uh, or dress or outfit um, because I don't want the witness to look like a lawyer. I want them to look like who they are. Um, you know, we just had a case uh, where even a, my witness, my expert witness, it was a ski accident case was being deposed. And I said, don't wear a suit and tie. You're a skier. You're not a guy in a suit and tie. Wear what you'd wear with your skis, you know, sk skier type gear more. It'll look more appropriate. So think about that. Um, think about how they're going to look to the jury. Usually if you say wear sort of your Sunday best type of thing or wear what you'd wear to your in-laws house for a holiday meal. You know, that's usually pretty good. Button down, sweaters, nice clothes. You don't want them to look too overdressed or too underdressed, but appropriate. So uh, talk to them about that. Give them guidance on outfits. Maybe the next time they come into prep, they want to wear what they're thinking about and uh, tell them to come in and you'll take a look at them. OK, uh, don't wear fancy jewelry. Uh, my father loves to tell a story about how a jury didn't give a lot of money to a client because they saw a big I think it was either a big diamond ring on her finger, engagement ring, or maybe uh, big uh, diamond earrings. They're like, oh, she didn't need it. She looked like she was pretty wealthy anyway. So you never know what a jury is going to look at. I always remember the story in a case where um, it was in Brooklyn in front of Judge Steinhardt. My client was uh, had been stepped into the gap between the platform and the train, and the train like took off and was dragging him. And when he showed up for his day of testimony, he had on these like uh, flat sole, shiny dress shoes that looked like it slipped just standing still. And my father looked at him and said, he can't wear those shoes. And my wife was there and she grabbed them and they ran out to Montague Street on Brooklyn and uh, found a shoe store and got him some like rubber sole, normal looking shoes um, because you never know what a jury's going to see. So think about these things. Think about it. Okay. Appearances matter, especially on direct exam. Then go through it all. Go through it all with your witness. Ask them the questions. Have your outline ready before they come in. Be prepared for them. Don't just wing it. Some of the stuff you'll fill in the blanks when they bring it out in the preparation, but go through the outline. Maybe you do half of it on the first meeting and then give them a sample of your outline or questions and tell them go home and practice. Uh, let your spouse ask you the questions and you practice answering. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not telling them what to say, but you're asking them to you know, practice answering questions out loud and feeling comfortable, okay? So go through the whole direct. You have to do that. Um, sometimes if it's a real tragic case, I may say, listen, I'm not going to ask you to answer these, you know, impact, you know, has it had an impact on, the, on your family's life, the fact that you don't have your husband anymore? I, I may not have them do that in a prep session, but I'll say, I'm going to ask this question um, and bring it, you know, bring it out. Don't be afraid to cry. You know, let the jury feel your emotion. Uh, those are important things. You have to give your witness the freedom to give answers uh, in a compelling way and let them know that you want them to do that. Okay. I also like to explain the concept of redirect examination. I will tell them what cross-examination is and how to prepare for it. I will tell them to read their pre-trial transcript, deposition transcript thoroughly. I explain sort of how impeachment works. And we'll obviously talk a lot about that at the program next month. But you want to prepare and inform your client, your witness, so they know they're not like a deer in the headlights. You prepare them how to answer questions on cross, short, direct, um, not long-winded, okay? But you let them know that you may be asked a question, a leading question on uh, on cross-examination and you feel you're not given an opportunity to answer it. And the lawyer sort of cuts you off and keeps on going. Or something comes out that you haven't had a chance to really explain. Explain to them 
That's what redirect is for. I will have the opportunity to get up and say, now, Mr. Amador, defense counsel didn't let you give an answer as to, you know, uh, you know why you didn't look in your side view mirror at that moment. Um, can you explain for the jury uh, why you didn't look in your side view mirror? And then Mr. Amador would say, yes, I just looked in it two seconds ago and there were no cars for 200 feet back. So I didn't think I had to look at it again. Um, whatever it may be, explain the redirect process. That's as important in your prep of the witness uh, as everything else, okay? Then you need to go through what items you may want to introduce into evidence through your witness. And this is important. And I want to spend a little bit of time on going into this. Um, many times with a plaintiff, you're gonna introduce photographs of the accident scene. Uh, you may introduce photographs of injuries. Uh, you may need to introduce documents that maybe they received or prepared. Uh, if you have a medical witness and you need to introduce medical records or exhibits or uh, enlargements, whatever it may be, um, you need to think about that when you're planning on the direct examination of witnesses as to what evidence you wanna get into trial, um, because it's not just going to be testimonial evidence. There's going to be photos, documents, videos, uh, whatever it is that you're going to want to put into evidence, okay? Tax returns, whatever it may be. And which witness are you going to get that in through? Uh, in my firm, when we're preparing for trial, we'll often say, all right, how are we going to get this into evidence? Which witness should we use? How will it be most effective? Um, so you want to make sure that you go over the items with the witness in advance. So if it's the plaintiff in an injury case um, and you want to uh, go through the exhibits, photographs of the accident scene and the vehicle or the motorcycle, um, and you want to put it in through that witness, then you tell them. And I would say in prep for Mr. Amador, I'd say, listen, at some point, I'm going to want to introduce these five photographs and ask you some questions about it. Here's one. It's of your motorcycle. Here's another. It's of the intersection. Here's another. It shows you uh, on a gurney outside the ambulance. Uh, here's another one, whatever it is. And the way that I'm going to do it is I'm going to ask the judge some things, and I'm going to approach you, and I'm going to show it to you, and I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions, and I'm going to tell you what those questions are. But don't worry if you forget, because your answer is going to be yes to all of that, okay? I'm going to say, Mr. Amador, does this photograph fairly and accurately depict what your motorcycle looked like on the day of the accident? Yes. I'm going to ask follow-up questions. Yes, yes, yes. And that's it. Okay. Um, but let them know that there's going to come a time that you're going to do that. Explain to them the process. And then if you're going to want to have them mark a photograph or a document, perhaps it's enlarged on a, you put it up on an easel. I personally like to use uh, enlarged exhibits. Sometimes we use computers and, and imagery to, you know, projectors to push it onto screens. Uh, I'm old school in that I like something tangible, uh, a blow-up board that has whatever it is, whether it's a photograph or a, or a business record of importance or a transcript page that a jury can look at, that I can hold up in summation that they can take into the jury room. So whatever that is, walk through it. If you're gonna have your witness mark things or point out things, go through that with them, okay? Now, how do you get something into evidence? Many of you know it or think you know it and some may not know it. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. It's, uh, it's on page 17, uh, PDF page 17 of your materials. And I just wanna go through this with you for a moment because it's super important that you know how to um, put an item into evidence because if you don't, then um, it could be really bad. And it reminds me uh, of a time that my father was trying a case. I think I was still in law school watching it, or I may have been a new lawyer, but it was many years ago. And it was before uh, Judge Gaberman, many of you remember. And uh, the defense wanted to put a surveillance video of our client into evidence. And he was a partner at a well-known firm, and he didn't lay the proper foundation questions through his witness. And my father would stand up and say, objection. Just look at Gammerman. Judge Garen goes, sustained. Ask another question. And this went on like 10, 15 times. All my fathers do is stand up and say, objection. Sustained. And the lawyer was frumfering around. And we're all sitting there. And the jury's looking at him. And it was really bad. If he was uh, an associate or attorney in my firm, uh, that would have been a big problem. It never would have happened in the first place. But it was crazy. 
And it was because he just missed one of the basic foundation questions of how to lay the foundation for putting something into evidence. And that it just, everything went downhill from him from there. So it's important as part of this seamless presentation, remember, that you're putting on for the jury, it's all smooth, it's all choreographed, okay? How you move about the courtroom when you do this. And here's how you do it. If you're listening to today's course via podcast, the first attendance verification code is P-O-D-513. Again, that's P-O-D-513. So I have this up on, on, on the shared screen. Uh, Michelle, tell me if it's not there, otherwise I'll assume everyone's seeing it. The first thing you do, thank you. If I was in a room, which I would prefer to be with all 984 of you, I would stand up and show you guys. Stand up at my table and I say, your honor, may I approach to have this item marked for identification? Yes, Mr. Smiley, you may. Thank you, your honor. I hold it and I approach in a deliberate manner with my buttoned up, looking professional, and I hand it to the um, court officer or the court clerk, whoever wants to take it. And uh, usually the judge will say, yes, but please show it to your adversary first. And I'll say, yes, I show it to my adversary. Yes, let the record reflect, I'm showing uh, this document to my adversary, you may approach. Then I approach, I say, your honor, uh, may we please have this marked as plaintiff's exhibit and whatever it is, uh, exhibit one for identification. And um, the judge will say, fine, it will be deemed plaintiff's exhibit one for identification. There's no stickers on it, no anything. Sometimes you can even ask it at the beginning, you know, your honor may approach with what I'd like to have marked as plaintiff's exhibit one for identification. You can combine those. Judge will say, show it to your adversary. Let the record reflect. I'm showing what's been uh, marked as plaintiff's exhibit one for identification to, to counsel. May I approach? Yes. You approach. May I please approach the witness? Yes. You approach the witness and you hand them the document or you show it to them. If it's a blow up, if it's a photograph, if it's something large, you position yourself with your back to the jury, which you usually don't want to do. But in this case, you just, the jury cannot see an item in evidence until it is in evidence. Remember that. So there's a, there's a little cloak and dagger here. You're showing it, but until it's in evidence, they can't see. It, okay. So you don't start waving something around on your walk up for a jury to look at, or you're going to get in big trouble. So you keep it away from the jury, you approach. Then when you show it to the jury is when you ask these foundation questions that I'm going to go through with you. They don't have to be these exact words, but the gist of them has to be there. Okay. Now, just briefly, I have a note here. If you're using pre-marked exhibits, I love pre-marked exhibits. Um, you usually do it in federal court. Many state court judges don't do it. Basically, what you do is you sit down and you agree with your adversary, all the exhibits you plan on introducing and that they plan on introducing, and you mark them. So I would have, if I knew I'd have 15 photographs uh, and other documents, I'd label them 1 through 15. Defense could label A through G. And then you're just standing up with that document that's been pre-marked. You have it typed up. Everybody knows what it is. You can give the court a sheet of the pre-marking and you don't have to go through the marking it at the time. And then if it gets into evidence, you can just leave it as that marking. Um, so you would skip the whole routine of approach to have something marked if it already is marked. But either way, you get to the point where you're approaching the witness with it and you're asking if you may show it to the witness and you wait for permission. You show it to the witness and the jury cannot see it, okay, while you're showing it to the witness. Another reason perhaps not to have something blown up on a big screen because you can't show it on a big screen where a jury would see. So here I would say to my client, Dustin Dibble, I'd say, Dustin, I'm handing you what's been marked as plaintiff's exhibit one for identification. Do you recognize it? And of course he's been prepared. So he says, yes, I do. The next question is, what do you recognize it to be? And he will say, I recognize it to be a photograph of my motorcycle. Okay, and again, you prepare them for that. When I show you a photograph and I say, what do you recognize this to be? You're going to say it's a motorcycle. You're going to say this is the scene of the accident. All right. Then after they say that, the next question is, and does this exhibit or does plaintiff's exhibit one for identification or does this document that I've just handed you fairly and accurately depict the fill in the blank? And this is what the lawyer in the case I told you about who couldn't get that video into evidence. This was the step he was missing. Okay. He didn't say, does this video 
fairly and accurately depict the video surveillance footage that you took of the plaintiff on March 10th, 2009. Okay. He kept missing this part. And so he wasn't laying the foundation. So you need to prepare your client. If it's a photograph, if it's a letter, if it's whatever it is, does it fairly and accurately depict it? And again, you've prepared your client, the witness to say, yes, 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 yes. So they're going to say yes. Okay. Um, Sometimes it may be a business record you're getting in through a witness. So at this time, you may want to say, um, was this document prepared by you or was it prepared by the police department officer in the norm, ordinary course of business? Yes, it was. Okay. And then you're establishing the foundation that way. That way. And then the last question you do is you say, and will this photo, will this document, will this record, uh, will plaintiff's exhibit one for identification aid and assist you in your testimony to this jury here today? Yes. At that point, you stop, you turn to the judge and you say, your honor, we now offer what's been marked as plaintiff's one for identification into evidence as plaintiff's one or just into evidence. Then the judge is going to turn to your adversary, Mr. Adversary, any objection to this? And then now's the time if you or your adversary during a direct exam has an objection, uh, if they didn't lay the foundation, if you think it shouldn't come in for whatever reason, um, that's where the, uh, the objection comes in and you address it. Otherwise, if you've done it right and you've given notice to your adversary, like we talked about in How to Litigate a Personal Injury series earlier this year, You've disclosed this photograph as part of your pretrial disclosures, so you're not going to get that objection saying, Your Honor, I've never seen this photograph before. Then they'll look at you, Mr. Smiley, did you give this photograph to defense counsel prior to just now? Uh, yes, Your Honor. In fact, here's my pretrial disclosure. I gave it to him, and I have an affidavit of service six months ago. Okay, that's being prepared. All right. Once you get through that objection, the judge will then say, uh, Yes, we will now receive that into evidence as plaintiff's one. Please proceed. Uh, let the court reporter put a sticker on it. Court reporter puts a sticker on it, dates it, plaintiff's one. Now it's plaintiff's one in evidence. And then you are free to show it to the jury and use it. Usually I say, Your Honor, may I now publish this to the jury or show it to the jury? Yes, yes, of course, Mr. Smiley. You don't have to ask me. It's in evidence. But you're showing a smoothness to this process of how to get something in. The jury sees you as a competent attorney. Your adversary sees you as a competent attorney. The judge has respect for you as a competent attorney. That's what you want. It's going to make things go. This is the good acting part. Bad acting is when someone doesn't know how to do this and doesn't ask questions and can't get a surveillance video into evidence and the jury's sitting there and rolling their eyes, the plaintiff's counsel, uh, laughing. Okay? That's bad. You don't want that to happen. All right? So, um, so I'm going to stop my share. So that's there to use that. Like I said, it doesn't have to be the exact words, but the gist of it um, should be uh, those steps. They identify it, it depicts it, it'll aid in the system, it's fair and accurate, and then you get it in. And that's how you get in photographs, documents, videos, use the same foundation questions. It is essential that you learn how to do that, okay? Practice it. Practice it with your client in preparation. So when it happens, they're not sitting there like, um, why is he handing me this? What should I be saying? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you don't want that to happen. That's where you have to have that preparation level. All right. Um, we're, I only have a few minutes left, and I've already seen a lot of questions on the Q&A, which are great, and I will address each and every one of them after the two o'clock hours, so stay tuned for that. I think you can ex actually get an extra half credit. Uh, Michelle will correct me if I'm wrong if you stay the full extra half hour. Um, now, once you get this document into evidence, use it, okay? There's a reason that you wanted to put something into evidence. Sometimes, um, you know, I've had a case where it's a really bad scarring in a sort of a sensitive area that my client has sustained. And I don't want them to have to drop their drawers in a courtroom. So we have a photograph. And then I say, can we publish it to the jury? And you actually hand it to them and they can pass it around and look at it. Sometimes you want a juror to see the smoking gun. You want them to see the evidence. You want them to see the document that has the statement where your adversary's witness gave it all up in the flesh. Um, whatever it is, 
You may want to publish it to the jury, which means you hand it to the court officer. They hand it to juror number one. They look at it. They nod. They pass it around to everybody. Then they hand it back. Sometimes you want to put it up on an easel and have the witness come down and mark it. And there are ways to properly do that. And if you're going to have them mark things on an easel, whether it's, we'll talk about it in future uh, uh, future CLEs when you have experts, like a medical expert. I always do what we call a uh, anatomy lesson, where we have blow-ups of the anatomy of that part of the body that is at issue, and they explain everything. And I go through with them, you know, stand to the side, don't block the jury, use this pen, mark with the letter red, with the color red, red marker here. So if it is something that you want to have your witness go through, put it up on the board, have the markers ready, or the, your laser pointer ready. Tell them in advance, prepare when I bring you here, I'm gonna guide you through, I'm gonna tell you to mark an X where this happens, put an arrow where that happens. And then in your direct, you have to make the record clear. So if someone's marking an exhibit with a red pen, there's nothing for a court reporter to take down. And you need to preserve your transcript. So every time they make a note, you say, Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witness has just placed a red X on the spot to represent where he was at the moment he was struck by the defendant's vehicle. The record will so reflect. And by putting it into words, when the transcript comes out for appellate review or any other reason, you have it there. If you don't do that, it's not reflected. And I've had a lot of trials where my adversary is doing that or asking my client to mark something on cross-examination and they're not asking for the record to reflect the marking. And I'll jump in. I'll say, Your Honor, I'm sorry, can we please have the record reflect that the witness has done this or that? Um, or can we please ask counsel to have the record reflect? So you always want to protect your record. You'll hear that a lot. That's in making your objections and making sure everything is down. Because if it's not showing up on a transcript at the end of the day, it didn't happen in your trial as far as any court reviewing it is concerned. So you want to practice marking exhibits. That's important as well. All right. Then, you know, you want to make sure that when you're done with everything and you've done this very smooth orchestrated presentation, uh, the good acting, the smooth, the smooth presentation that a jury is going to get everything smoothly without being confused, without interruption. Okay. Then you end on a strong question. Okay, make sure you know what your last question is, have it written out, have it notated. Um, if it's a damages question, if you're at the end of a trial where damages are an issue, I usually like to ask, you know, Mr. Dibble, what, what's the worst part about this injury? If you can share that with the jury, please. And I leave it at that. I usually like to say, what's the worst part? Or do you have any concerns for the future? Um, what's your biggest fear looking ahead? Things like that. Um, because then you're ending on a compelling question. It's open. It's not going to be objected to. On direct and cross, you never, ever, ever want to end with an objection being sustained and you saying, oh, okay, and sort of uh, meekly uh, dropping your head and walking back to your counsel seat. You want to end strong on everything you do in a trial. That's why I said at the end of opening statement, you smile, you say thank you. You look everyone in the eye and walk tall back to your seat. Again, at the end of a deposition, uh, of a direct examination, I'm sorry, you want to end with a question. Then you want to say thank you to your witness. Then you close up your book and you walk back strongly to your table. And then they will let your adversary do cross-examination, which you have prepared your witness for. Now, the other thing I'll tell you is that I like to have some signals, some cues uh, with my clients and my witnesses. And one of the things I like to use is the pen or pencil trick. And what I do is I tell them in preparation, don't be too long winded. Sometimes I'll even do this in depositions as well. And I'll say, if you see me hold my pen either up like this, where it's vertical or on the table, you know, I'll rest it right on council table. It means you're talking too much. You're blabbing, tighten up your answers. Stop giving such long answers. Make the lawyer ask you another question. So that's my pen pencil trick. It's the vertical holding. If that comes up, they got to slow it down. All right. They got to tighten up their answers. They're talking too much. They're saying more than they need to. Um, so you can let them know that. Again, you can let them know that you'll be able 
to get back up and redirect. You'll be able to give them the opportunity to explain. And then you sit there through cross-examination and you can choose when to object. In general, folks, my, my recommendation is object when it's important. I once was in a trial with a very, I thought, seasoned defense firm uh, attorney. His name was on the door. He was the senior partner overseeing the case that the associate handled up until the time of trial. And at the time that I was just doing background, I said something like, can you tell the jury, you know, where you live? Uh, Whatever it was, it was something very basic. Objection, leading. And I was like, what? First of all, it wasn't leading. Secondly, why are you objecting to that? And the judge, she wasn't a very uh, skilled trial judge at the time, I guess, brought us into chambers to have a discussion on what's direct, uh, what's, what's leading, what's not. So don't object unless it's really important and you have a legitimate basis, okay? And then I will close and I'll let Michelle do the last poll. Use direct exam only if you need to. If your witness held up well, don't get up just because it's another opportunity. Do it to let your witness explain something or clarify something that didn't come out too clear in uh, their cross-examination and use it wisely. So, and by the way, with the Q&A, uh, please feel free to ask anything and everything. I'll try and address it all. If I don't address something or you'd rather contact me directly, uh, my email's right here, shoot me an email. Uh, I may not get back to you immediately, but I will get back to you usually within 24 hours. I try and get back to all my emails uh, and calls promptly. Um, what I also like to do, many of you know, is when there is a Q&A session like this, um, I don't profess to have all the answers. I'm just like you are, a lawyer working hard, trying to make sense of things, trying to learn, trying to do things right, and try to share from experience what I think has worked well. If you agree or you like it or it helps, awesome. If not, that's cool too. There's plenty of people attending this webinar who know more than me, uh, either in general or uh, on a specific area. So if you see a question in the Q&A, or you have advice, share it, put it in the Q&A so everybody can see it. I learn a lot uh, from the CLEs, uh, from people posting things uh, in there, okay? So let's get through it. Thanks to the 800 plus of you staying on. I'll try and make it worth your while uh, by addressing things and questions. And there were a lot of good questions that I saw. And uh, the first question is in a bifurcated trial, that being uh, in some venues, the trial is not all unified. It is Uh, not liability and damages together, but broken up. You have to prove liability first. And then if you get uh, an award of some sort on liability, uh, then it's a whole new trial on damages. Uh, And that's the focus of the second part of the trial. So if it is a bifurcated trial and it is just on liability, then no, you should not be talking about the injuries uh, in your opening statement. You should not be talking about the injuries uh, in, the, in the direct examination uh, and the damages. That's not appropriate for the liability only trial. You can ask questions about it during opening sta- uh, during um, jury selection, as we talked about two months ago in part one, because in theory, if all goes well, the jury uh, will be the same jury for damages afterwards. You don't go through and do it again. So uh, be careful in a bifurcated trial. Basically, you're going to end your direct examination of the injured plaintiff when they get hauled off in the ambulance, okay, um, before getting into the damages testimony. Uh, and then you'll pick up in damages with, all right, we talked about the liability part in the accident. Let's hear what happened as a result of that. You go from there. Uh, there's a question, how do you get a message left on an answering machine? I don't know if that is someone saying, how do you get that into evidence? Um, uh, if there's a message on a machine or a voicemail. But what you do is you save it somehow, Uh, you save the recording, you exchange it with your adversary pre-trial, and at the time of trial, um, you say, we'd like to offer this into evidence, Uh, and if a jury's not supposed to hear it, then you can have that proceeding in the absence of the jury. You could say, Your Honor, uh, before the jury gets called in today, uh, uh, we'd like to put the witness on the stand uh, and put something into evidence. Uh, and it's a, it's a voicemail message. And again, you go through the same things. You just heard that. What is it? Where did this come from? Yeah, this is from my voicemail, from my phone. And I recorded it and I sent it to you. And that's, that's how you would get in that type of item. Okay. Um, 
Now, someone's asking me about the trick I talked about where you ask a leading question and put the answer sort of in it because they just haven't given you the answer you want. So you lead and you tell them the answer. Um, what if that happens and then your adversary stands up and says, come on, your honor, you, you know, Mr. Smiley just led and gave him the answer. And now you're allowing him in essence to ask the same question in an open form. Um, and this person saying that uh, he or she had a judge who did not allow the second question. Now, I would take issue with that. It's, you know, you can ask an open question. You could say you just have to phrase it properly. So sometimes you got to work a little bit. You get objections sustained a couple of times. But if you phrase it as a proper open question, there is no basis for a judge to deny you. And that could be reversible error, in my opinion, or an abuse of discretion, especially if it's an important matter. So be diligent, uh, be tough, stay at it. Never give up is another point. If there's something you need for your case to get into evidence and you're having a hard time and objections are getting sustained, keep fighting. Keep asking it differently. If you need to say, may I have a moment, Your Honor, go speak to your colleague or somebody or make a phone call and get back to it or take a break. Don't miss an opportunity to get something into evidence because you haven't framed the question. Hopefully, you've prepared for something important. Um, Sometimes you may know, hey, this is a tough one. It may not get in. You tell the client that. You tell them we're going to try it different ways. Um, and I may get objected to, but you got to prepare and do the best you can. Okay. Um, all right. So I have to keep scrolling back to the questions to take them in order here. Um, someone suggested they took their client to the courthouse a week beforehand uh, as part of the trial prep. I think that's a great idea. If you have the opportunity to either go or tell the client to go and take a look in the courthouse, look in the courtrooms, look in the jury selection, you know, assembly areas, get a feel for it. That's really helpful. Like I've said, I like to go and get the lay of the land before trial. I think a, a witness would certainly like to do that as well. Someone saying their client is a pastor. Uh, should he wear his collar for trial? Um, I would probably do that uh, because I think it gives a, 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 an air of being a clergyman and having, you know, if that person's not telling the truth, the wrath of, uh, of, of God's going to come down. Um, so, yeah, I would have clergy members wear their uniforms. Uh, I would have police officers wear their police uniforms. Uh, I would certainly recommend doing that. Um, Someone's asking about uh, virtual trials and direct exam by affidavits. Would you lose that in-person power? I have not tried a case yet uh, since the one I've been talking about, the Amador case in March of 2020. Um, and if I was told I could try a case by choice virtually, I would decline. If I had to, I would. Um, but my preference would be not to uh, do anything virtually. You can lose jurors. You don't see what they're doing. There's just too many chances for problems. I would not do any virtual trial. I, I'm fine doing virtual mediations or arbitrations, depending on the extent of it, but certainly not something that would be trial level. I would not recommend doing that virtually. Um, on a damages trial, the question is, um, would I call the plaintiff first or the treating medical expert? Now, usually, um, usually I would call the plaintiff first, okay? Um, Sometimes if I feel that the plaintiff is not able to articulate his or her injuries as well, perhaps, as our medical expert or the treating, then I may have the treating come on first to lay the landscape so that, you know, perhaps maybe in a brain injury case, um, you would have your uh, neurologist uh, or neuropsychologist come on and explain why um, the plaintiff may not be uh, able to communicate well on the stand or may not remember things so that uh, when the witness gets on the stand, that whole context is taken into consideration by the jury. Also, sometimes you're, you're stuck with scheduling. Uh, that's one of the biggest problems with trials is coordinating. The judge is like, all right, we want your doctor on tomorrow morning or Wednesday morning. And you call up, the doctor's like, I don't testify on Wednesday mornings. I'm in surgery. So sometimes you have to go out of order. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, you can plan as much as you want, but trials throw a lot of curveballs at you. So again, if you have the luxury of knowing you can put them in at any time, think about how it would present and, and do it what you think is best. As always, uh, you can reach out to me or any other lawyers and workshop it. Say, here's my case. What do you think? Who do you think would be best to go on? And the questions I would ask you is, how's your, how's your client? Good witness? Bad witness? 
How's your doctor? Good witness, bad witness? How are the injuries? You know, um, who else do you have? Where's your venue? That kind of thing. All right. Um, let's see what else we have here. What is the best way to get emails into evidence and avoid a hearsay objection when the emails are exchanged between non-parties or inner office emails between individuals and defendants' offices? Uh, you represent the plaintiff and your adversary won't stipulate to the admission. Well, I believe that as long as you have one, it's like a it's like a phone call, right? If you have one party to the correspondence on the stand who could verify and authenticate with those foundation questions. Yes, this is an email. Yes, this was from my computer. Yes, this uh, was on this date and time. I think that's how you get it in. Um, if it's non-parties, if you, you'd have to subpoena them uh, and, and put it in through them. So ultimately the, the idea work, at work with getting items into evidence is you have to have someone that has a connection to that evidence on the stand. If it doesn't get in through some other exception uh, with a business record, hospital record, certified medical bills, there's some things you don't need a person on the stand for. Um, but there are some things like an email exchange that you need somebody. So you need to get a party to that email exchange on the witness stand. And if you don't have control, then you subpoena them and you keep fighting to get them in there and, and do it. But those are, it's a good question. Um, if you give your client an outline to prepare, do you run the risk of defense counsel asking, did you review anything to prepare? Um, and that's why they don't go over it, because maybe it can be discovered. You know, I'm not going to tell you what to say to your clients or what to do. Um, but if you say to the client, listen, you know, they're not allowed to ask you what you and I talk about and what we go over. And that's privileged. All right. Um, so do I want you to use this to for, as a document you need to prepare you to answer questions? No. Do I want you as a tool to help you and I be on the same page with the questions and answers? Yeah, that's fine. And, you know, you can, I, you, you can make sure that this, you know, outline, you don't have it, you've never seen it, that type of thing. I mean, you have to feel what's comfortable. I certainly feel comfortable having a Q&A or outline with my clients that they go over um, and helping to prepare them. I'm not telling them what to answer. Uh, they can say, yes, Mr. Smiley gave me a list of questions that he wanted to me be, be prepared to answer. Okay, that's not discoverable. That's a communication and preparation for litigation between you and your client. So just be careful with how you go about doing it. Okay, but remember, privilege communication. Um, how do you avoid not sounding too rehearsed? You know, it's better. No one's going to know. The answers don't come out. They don't seem rehearsed. They just don't. Just because you're practicing asking questions and they're practicing answering them, a jury's not going to say, wow, that looks like a super rehearsed answer. Um, and that's up to you as the lawyer to size up if a witness in your preparation is giving answers that you just think sound like weird, that it has to be rehearsed, or it's something that they wouldn't know that word or that expression, but for it coming from a lawyer, you know, then stay away from that. Um, but otherwise, you know, I prepare all my witnesses in the way I've described, and it's never come out sounding rehearsed. Because although we've rehearsed the, the idea of me asking questions and them giving answers, we're not rehearsing an answer. Say it this exact way every time, and they turn like a robot and give it. So you have to, you have to use your good judgment. I mean, that's where the skill of a trial attorney comes in. It's not only in doing it at trial, but in preparing. And a lot of that comes down to judgment and using good judgment. Okay, so rely on your judgment. If you're not sure, ask somebody in your firm, or if you don't have anybody to ask, reach out to another lawyer outside of your firm. Reach out to me. I'm always happy to workshop this stuff. Um, what was on the video that you didn't want the jury to see? Someone's asking me in the case where the, well, the video finally got in um, and it was a surveillance video. And I have to tell you, my friends there on the defense side, unless the video shows them doing something completely against what they've testified that they can't do. For example, if they say, I can't even walk a block, I can't run, and the video has them um, going out for a run, that's a good surveillance video. But if they say, I can't go for long walks, it hurts, 
and you have a surveillance video that shows him getting out of the car, slowly walking into a 7-Eleven, walking out slowly with a coffee and getting in their car, don't use it, okay? Those are 99% of the surveillance videos I get served on me are like that. They don't show anything. They show bad camera footage. They show someone spying on the client. And I love it when it comes into evidence because I use it uh, in my summation to say, not only will they not acknowledge their fault at this case, which you've seen as apparent, but then what do they do instead of acknowledging it and trying to, you know, uh, you know, realize what they've done to this person? They, they send somebody to spy on them? Can you believe that? They, how, many, how many times did I ask? They were out there Monday, Friday. They were camped out in a van. They had surveillance going with the kids walking by. Can you believe they did that? This is how they're defending the case? Members of the jury, it's outrageous. You know, how dare they? Um, and it showed nothing. What did it show? So that's how he handled it. And that's how uh, my father handled that video. And it was effective. He won that trial. It was a video showing her. It was a, it was a knee injury, I believe. And they had a surveillance video of her sitting out by a pool in a bathing suit with her leg just on the, on the shades. I mean, what does that have to do with anything other than be violent? So um, you object, you, you give him a hard time. He looks bad putting it in. And then when it comes in, it looks bad that they did it. I mean, these are the things you have to skillfully handle and think about in a trial. Um, should you add, does the plaintiff's exhibit fairly and accurately depict the scene of the accident at the time of your accident? Sure. I mean, if that's what you, you want to show, um, sometimes you're just showing the intersection. Is this the intersection? And is this how it appeared to you at the time of the accident? Again, yeah, you want to use those words. Again, the, the questions I gave to you uh, I don't have to be exact. Um, you know, use it as you will. What is the purpose of the last question to submit an evidence? Is it necessary? So I'm assuming that question uh, goes to when I'm asking concerns for the future. Um, it's damages. It's damages. It's damages questions. I want to be able to get up in front of the jury and say, you heard Dustin Dibble talk about the impact the loss of his leg has had on him and that he's worried that, yeah, he's a young guy now. He can get around and he can use his arm strength to accommodate but what about when he's 60, 70, 80 years old? It's not going to be that easy for him. He's worried about that. That's a loss of future loss of enjoyment of life element that a jury can consider. So that's the relevance there. Um, what is the point of asking whether or not an item will aid a witness in their testimony? I've never used that or heard it used to lay the foundation. Does that show relevance in some vague way? I use that because I've seen it required. Um, and I've seen it as a basis for an objection. I've seen a judge turn and say to a medical expert, do you need this? Do you really need this? It's a, you know, uh, why do you need this? Um, and I find that it's very helpful and it's a cap. It's a safety net. If you throw that in, it'll protect you and say, yes, it's going to aid them. Uh, because I believe from somewhere I've learned that if it's an item in evidence, um, that one of the things to consider uh, on the proper admission, if it's something that will aid the presentation of testimony and aid the witness in that. So you, if you don't have to use it, all power to you, don't use it. I've always used it, so I recommend doing it and preparing the witness to say it will aid them. But if you don't need it, then go for it without it. How do I deal with a question by an adversary uh, for a voir dire to support an objection to the introduction of an exhibit? So the question is saying, you know, the, the adversary wants to jump in and do the voir dire and basically a mini cross-examination on an item of evidence. You know, I would object to any voir dire. Um, I don't think it's appropriate during a cross. They object. They object to the basis. And if they really want it, they ask the judge uh, and they can ask to do it out of the presence of the jury. The judge grants it, they grant it. But I, I don't like giving up my control of a trial. So if I'm directing a witness, I don't want to hand over a time to my adversary to go in and use 10, 15 minutes uh, grilling my client in front of the jury. That's interrupting my presentation. So I do everything I can to avoid that. I'll say, counsel, plenty of time to cross-examine this witness uh, about that, you know, when uh, it's his or her time to to get out in question. Otherwise, if the judge grants it, there's only so much you could do, but you would do it out of the presence of the jury. 
Can I briefly address the introduction of medical records? Sure. Um, if you have a hospital chart that is certified and that is subpoenaed to the courthouse, that can go in under CPLR 4518 as a, uh, there's a specific provision for that without having the need of a witness on the stand. You could introduce that outside the presence of the jury before they come in into evidence and there's really no basis to object to it, okay? Same thing with hospital bills. So hospital charts, hospital bills, you always wanna request that they be certified and subpoenaed. If you show up with a certified copy, that's usually not good enough. Sometimes your adversary will stipulate to it. If it comes directly to the subpoenaed records room uh, with the certification, then you satisfy uh, the CPLR and you don't need a witness. Where it gets a little tricky is with like a medical practice. You're, the client's been treating, excuse me, the witness has been treating at a, at a group of physicians, primary care physicians, LLC. Those don't come in uh, with a certification in the same way unless you specifically go through certain steps in the CPLR, which are laid out there, where you serve notice of your intention to introduce them. You have the proper certification. You serve a set in advance. So there are certain ways to get those records in from a practice, medical practice. Um, it's a little more complex and more steps you have to take uh, than with a hospital chart. Um, so you wanna make sure you do that. Same thing with x-ray images, MRIs. There's specific provisions where you give notice. Uh, prior to trial, if your adversary doesn't object in time, then they really don't have a basis at the time of trial, so you can look that up. Pretty much any item you want to get into evidence, you're going to want to start with 4518. If it's not there, look through the annotations, look through the other uh, sections of the CPLR. You can usually find it for how to get something into evidence. If you can't find it or if it doesn't fit into something, then you need a witness from that source, like the emails we were talking about, uh, to get it into evidence, okay? Question, how can we get an attorney's letter to a defendant into evidence, for example, to prove notice? The attorney cannot testify that it is a business record. Then I would, I would, show, it to the, um, I would show it to the witness uh, that it got sent to and say, didn't you get this? Um, and again, find where you get it from. Sometimes you may get it in discovery. So whatever source you get it from, you might have to subpoena that source. If you got it in discovery from defense, in an exchange and it's verified off by the witness, uh, you can try and get it in through that way. Um, if you need to, you can subpoena the law firm uh, to prove that it came from that firm or that lawyer uh, and get it in to evidence that way. Again, as long as it's a party, someone who received it, it was addressed to, or someone who sent it, all right? Um, so, Documents where there could be hearsay issues, should they be subpoenaed to the court for trial? Um, you know, police reports don't need to be subpoenaed, but if you do want to put it into evidence, um, really you, you would want the police officer on the stand. Um, I mentioned in prior CLEs that in my last trial, the judge rightfully really pressed my adversary on what objection they would have to not stipulating that it's the police report and putting it into evidence. And that if there were hearsay statements in it, we could address that. Um, we could uh, redact it, if need be. But why would we want to take somebody who's protecting us uh, off the streets uh, to testify um, in a courtroom? Uh, so uh, you don't need to subpoena it. Uh, police reports will often have hearsay issues, uh, and it doesn't change whether it's subpoenaed or you bring a copy of it. But you should make sure you have a certified copy of it. Um, and police officers will always show up if you subpoena them. You just serve it on one police plaza, the subpoena, okay? Um, can I show a witness a document so they can testify about it because I haven't given it to the other side? Uh, you haven't given them notice. Uh, no, you can't. You can't start popping documents up at trial that your adversary has not seen. That's the way we work. Uh, go back to my cousin Vinny. I love to talk about it. You have to give him the whole, he has to give you the whole file. Uh, you know, you, you have to give notice. If you're going to put an item into evidence, um, you have to show it to him. Look, we all drop the ball sometimes. You may be preparing for trial and it's even the night before and you say, oh my God, I need to get this into evidence. I'm looking through and I didn't serve it on advance. What do you do? Yeah, email your adversary right away. You call them up and say, listen, I know it's short notice, 
but I really want to put this into evidence. I'm sending it to you. Do you have an objection? Can we sort it out? I don't think it's prejudicial. And you work it out. Um, and uh, you try and come to terms because more likely than not, your adversary may have something they want to put into evidence late. So uh, it's good for the goose, as they say. So you try and sort it out, but you can't just pop something up and give it to a witness uh, without uh, your adversary seeing it first, okay? Um, so I was asking if it's ethical to communicate with signals during cross-examination, I guess, in response to my pen. You know, all I'm doing is holding up my pen. What do you want me to say? I'm not communicating. I'm not saying anything. I'm not giving them answers. I'm not telling them anything. I mean, so how's that going to come out? Again, use your discretion. Uh, you know, if you're sitting there and your witness is up there and you're like, no, no, don't say that, you know, then that's, you know, then you're going to draw an objection and you're going to get reprimanded by the court if they see it. Mr. Smiley, uh, you should not be uh, suggesting answers to your client. You know that. If I see that happen again, we're going to have a problem. So, you know, I'm not suggesting an answer. It's just a sign saying, you know, you're talking too much. So, again, you have to be smart about what you're doing. You never want to cross the line. If you think you're doing something unethical, don't do it. Um, if I'm being told that holding my pen up is unethical, then I'll stop doing it. I don't think it is. Could be wrong. I hope I'm not. Um, how do I handle a competent but demented witness? Husband held against his wife and husband held against his and his wife's wishes in a nursing home. They're claiming false imprisonment. No medical reason not to let him come home. So I guess the question is you want to put a witness on the stand, but they're they've got medical, you know, psychological issues. Um, that might be the situation where you're going to want to call a physician first. And you're going to want to preview that to the jury. You're going to say, listen, you're going to hear from Mr. Smith. Um, and I want to give you a little heads up of what I expect his testimony to be like. I anticipate uh, that because uh, I expect you will learn about his injuries and he had a brain injury or because he suffers from a condition that we anticipate you'll learn about, that his testimony may be disjointed, may not make sense. It may not seem real. It may be overly emotional. Um, but... I ask you to keep an open mind, and I, and I uh, will anticipate you hearing from medical testimony either before or after, uh, explaining why. Uh, and it's important that you see the impact uh, of how this person is, because that's part of this case. So when you have a situation like that, that you know is potentially a difficult witness, um, then you want to try and deal with it. I had in the, this, the Amador case, the motorcycle case, um, English wasn't his first language. And I was really worried. And I started off the trial with him through an interpreter. And I asked in jury selection, I said, I expect you may hear my client speaking through an interpreter. Is that okay for you? You're going to hold that against him that he's not speaking in English. Um, and uh, I wanted to get that out to them so that they, they, were, they had a little bit of a sense. And it turns out that the, the core translator was just, it was making things more difficult that we figured, you know what, let's try it without a translator. And uh, the second day he was on the stand, or later that day, we said, uh, all right, Mr. Armando, we're going to try without a translator. Let's see how we do. Go from there. And we did, and it was better. So the most you can give your, your, the jury a preview of the strengths and weaknesses, including witnesses, the strength and weakness of a witness, the better. Uh, See how fast time goes. I'm so thrilled you've all stayed with me this long. I'm going to answer one more question uh, and the rest I'll try to handle in uh, one-on-ones with all of you. you. If you're listening to today's course via podcast, the second verification poll is P-O-D-684. That's P-O-D-684. Thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. Please feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, I will try and uh, get back to you, as I said. The last question I'm going to answer, which I think is an important question to, to address, is this. Should any subject be saved for redirect, or should everything be covered on direct? My initial response to that is if it's something that you need for your case in chief, as a prima facie case, or in your defense, don't save it. Because if your adversary says, I've got no more, I don't have any cross-examination, um, then you lose the opportunity. Or if your adversary asks a very limited scope of questions uh, on cross, direct exam can only address things that came out in cross. You can't come up with something new. That's the other thing about direct. 
uh, redirect. So redirect is to address things that came out in cross. So if you save something and that topic isn't covered in cross or there is no cross exam, you've lost that opportunity. So bring it out. The only time you may want to save something is if there is something negative and you're concerned, you know, maybe a prior conviction um, and you don't know if your adversary is going to bring it out or not. What you may want to do, and that's this is total judgment, you have to really think about it, depending on the case, the circumstances, uh, whether it was asked at a deposition. Um, if you think it may not come out, you may not want to address it, okay, and direct and address it and prepare your witness and tell them that and say, but if they bring it out on cross, I'll get up and let you explain that conviction or what happened. Otherwise, you don't bring it out. So that's the only time I would hold something back specifically for redirect. Otherwise, no, I'd go straight for it. So with that, I know we're waiting on some others. I want to thank everybody for joining me. Uh, I hope to see you for cross-examination next month on December 1st. And um, as always, uh, please reach out to me with any questions. If you're listening on the podcast, thank you so much. Please continue to do so. Share the podcast, like it, share it with your friends, colleagues, law students, and I'll see you all next month. Thank you so much.